Buddha Kola is a ritual folk dance from the coastal districts Tulu Nadu of Karnataka, India. The dance is highly stylized and held in honor of the local deities worshipped by the Tulu-speaking population. It bears resemblance to the Thayam of Kerala and has influenced Yakshagana folk theatre. Buddha Kola could be categorized as a form of shamanism as the dancer performing it goes into a trance and acts as an oracle for the deity being impersonated. Topic. Definition The word is derived from Buddha Tulu for spirit, deity, in turn derived from Sanskrit Buddha for free elements, which is purified, fit, proper, true, past, creatures, anglicized, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha and Kola Tulu for play, performance, festival. A Buddha Kola or Nima is typically an annual ritual performance where local spirits or deities Buddhas, Devas, are being impersonated by ritual specialists from certain scheduled castes such as the Nalike, Pambada, or Parawa communities. The Buddha cult is prevalent among the non-Brahmin Tuluvas of Tulu Nadu region. The word Kola is conventionally reserved for the worship of a single spirit whereas a Nima involves the impersonation of several spirits in hierarchical order. In Kolas and Nima's family and village disputes are referred to the spirit for mediation and adjudication. In feudal times, the justice aspect of the ritual included matters of political justice, such as the legitimation of political authority, as well as aspects of distributive justice. The produce of land directly owned by the Buddha commons as well as certain contributions from the leading manors was redistributed among the villagers. Performance The ritual performance at a Buddha Kola or Deva Nima involves music, dance, recital, and elaborate costumes. Recitals in Old Tulu recount the origins of the deity and tell the story of how it came to the present location. These epics are known as padanas. Types of Buddhas Thurston counts among the best known deities Brahmaru, Kodamanataya, Kukintaya, Jumadi, Sarala Jumadi, Pancha Jumadi, Rakteshwari, Panjurli, Kuppi Panjurli, Rakta Panjurli, Jurundaya, Urundareya, Hosadavada or Hosa Buddha, Devanagiri, Kalkuta, Tukateri, Gulaj, Babariya, Nicha, Dugalaya, Mahazandaya, Varte, Chamundi, Badarukulu, Ukatiri, Kalarti, Sharadi, Ulalthi, Okubalala, and Odityay. According to some, Jumadi is the small pox goddess Mari. The Buddhas are supposed to belong to different castes. For example Okubalala and Devanagiri are Jains, Kodamanataya and Kukinataya are Bunts, Kalkuta is a smith, Babariya is a Mapilla, and Nietzsche a Koraga. Some of them are ancestral spirits such as Babariya, Kalkuta, Kalarti, Siri, Kumar Koti and Chenaya. Some are deified wild animals such as the boar, Panjurli the female counterpart is Varte Panjurli or the tiger, Pilichamundi. Some Buddhas are androgynous such as some instances of Jumadi who is represented as female below the neck breasts, but with a male head sporting a mustache. There are anthropomorphic Buddhas, zoomorphic ones, and mixed forms such as the Malaraya of Kodlamagaru, Kasargod, who has the head of a wild boar and the body of a woman. Depending on the significance of the people who worship them, Buddhas or Devas can be family deities Katumbata Buddha, local or village deities Jagata Buddha, Yurata Buddha, or deities associated with administrative units such as manorial estates Guttis, groups of estates Magain, districts Saim, or even small kingdoms Royal Buddhas or Rajandivas. Cosmology According to the ethnographer Peter Claus, the Tulu Padanas reveal a cosmology which is distinctly Dravidian and thus different from the Puranic Hindu cosmology. Importantly, priesthood is not the preserve of a caste learned in scriptures but is shared between the ruling aristocracy on one hand and ritual specialists from the lower strata of society on the other hand. The world is divided in two three realms, firstly, the realm of cultivated lands Gramya, secondly the realm of wastelands and forests Jangala, Aranya, and thirdly the realm of spirits Buddha Loka. 
Gramya and Jangala, Aranya form part of the tangible world, whereas Buddha Loka is their intangible counterpart. As Gramya is constantly threatened by encroachment, disease, hunger and death form Jangala and Aranya, so is the tangible world under constant threat from the intangible world of the spirits. The world of the forest is the world of the wild, unordered, uncontrolled, hungry beings of destruction. The world of the forest and the world of the spirits are therefore seen as mirror images of each other. The wild animals threatening the human cultivator and his fields such as the tiger, the snake, the wild boar, and the bison, find their mirror images in their corresponding Buddhas Pili, Naga, Panjali and Mazandaya. The relationship between these three worlds is one of balance and moral order. If this order is upset by the humans, it is believed that the spirits become vicious. If the order is maintained, the spirits are believed to be supportive and benevolent. Thus, the spirits of Tulu culture are neither good nor bad as such, they are neither cruel nor capricious. They methodically and persistently remind a lax humanity of the need for morality and the value of solidarity. Nobody is believed to be above the moral and cosmological norms of this threefold universe, not even the spirits or the gods. Thus the Buddhas are not whimsical or arbitrary in their judgment. The Buddhas are their patrons protectors with regard to a system of moral norms, not despite them. Feudal relations of tribute and fealty mark the relations among the humans in the tangible world, among spirits in the intangible world and between humans and spirits across tangible and intangible worlds. While the world of humans is ruled by a mortal king, the world of the spirits is ruled by Burmeru, the lord of the forest and of the Buddhas. And just as the landed aristocracy depended on protection and support from their king, the world of humans depends on protection and support from the spirits. Thus once in a year at the time of Kola or Nima, the lord of the human world patriarch, landlord, king, has to be reconfirmed in his authority by reporting to the spirit to which he is accountable. While the temporal lord's authority is dependent on the spirit, the authority of the spirit is guaranteed by the active participation of the villagers in the ritual. Thereby a certain degree of political legitimacy is upheld by the active participation of the villagers. Their withdrawal from the ritual can seriously affect the authority of the landlord. As Claus observes, the principal mediators in this network of feudal transactions are communities who once upon a time may have led a liminal life between Gramya and Jangala, Aranya. Tribal communities living in and off the forest and trading in forest products were predestined to serve as spirit impersonators as their life world. The forest, is only the tangible side of the world of the spirits. In pursuit of their livelihood they regularly transgress structural boundaries between village and forest. They live on the margins of the village, in the wasteland between forest and field, thus they are themselves, in a sense, liminal. That such liminal people should be mediums for the spirits seems entirely apartment. Today communities like Nalike, Parava or Pambada who impersonate different kinds of Buddhas and Devas can no longer be characterized as tribal. They are mostly landless agricultural laborers in the wet season and spirit impersonators in the dry season. <laughs> <laughs> Worship Today feudal relations no longer obtain and thus former ruling families no longer hold any political or judicial office. But still the village demands that they sponsor their annual kola or nima to honor the village deity. The people believe that the neglect of the spirits will make their life miserable. Even though they may have changed, Buddha kola and deva nima still serve secular as well as religious purposes. In fact the two cannot be separated in a world where the tangible is suffused with the intangible. As the cosmology underlying the Padanas suggests, the very order of the human world and the order of the spirit world are interdependent. Buddhas and Devas are not worshipped on a daily basis like mainstream Hindu gods. Their worship is restricted to annual ritual festivals, though daily pujas may be conducted for the ritual objects, ornaments, and other paraphernalia of the Buddha. Unlike with the better known Hindu gods of the Puranic variety, Buddha worship is congregational. Secular function The secular function of the kola or nima has been described as a sacred court of justice, where traditional feudal moral ideals are brought to bear on difficult real-life situations. Buddha kolas and deva nimas are assemblies of the entire village. Thus they become an occasion to resolve conflicts in the village. 
The royal deva, Rajan deva rules over a former small kingdom or large feudal estate. He or she is mostly the family deity of rich land-owning patrons of the Bant caste whose position and power they reflect, confirm and renew. The relationship between the Buddhas, manor heads, and the villagers forms a transactional network which reaffirms the caste hierarchy and power relations in a village. The duty assigned to every category is differential but based on mutuality. The manor head by staging the Nima seeks to symbolically proclaim himself to be the natural leader of the community. The villagers offer Siva during the Nima in the form of service and prostrations and in doing so also offer their support to the Nima and their recognition of the leader's status. In return, the villagers expect justice and resolution of disputes by the Deva during the Nima. In the Nima, the leading manors offer a part of their farm products to the Deva, which are then redistributed to the villagers. The Nima thereby underlines the mutuality on which feudal relations used to be based and, in a limited way, takes care of the problem of social distributive justice. The Buddhas receive these offerings and in return give oracles and blessings to ensure the future prosperity of the village humans, animals, fields. Finally, a part of these offerings will be distributed as prasada among the heads of the guttas and other villagers according to their ranks. The system of entitlements is constituted in, or embodied by, the mutual gifting activity between the Buddhas, as the ultimate owner of the land, and people in rituals, creating a transactional network among them. <laughs> <laughs> Ritual script The script of the ritual changes from one nima to another, thus the following description is somewhat ideal typical. The ritual begins with the paraphernalia of the Buddha being brought to the shrine which serves as a venue for the festival. They are placed on an altar or on a swinging cot, which is the insignium of a royal Buddha The Nalike, Parava or Pambada medium prepares for the impersonation of the spirit with a recital of from the Padana of the Buddha or Deva. After this, the medium starts putting on makeup and dressing up in his costume which may include an elaborate ani a giant halo string to the back of the dancer. Finally, the medium is given the ornaments from the hoard of the shrine. As he enters the arena, the attendant of the spirit Patri gives him his sword, his bell and other paraphernalia and the patron Jajman gives him one or several burning torches. As the medium begins to dance, the spirit enters his body. Two people hold the torches along with the medium at all times. Thus, the entrance of spirit into this world is restrained. The medium's dance gains more force as the possession continues. He brings the torches dangerously close to his body. The Jajman now stands in a ritualistic circle on the ground with his assistance and offerings are made to the Buddha. These offerings often include the sacrifice of a chicken whose blood is sprinkled on the ground to enhance the fertility of the land. These sacrificial acts are followed by offerings of puffed rice, beaten rice, coconut pieces, bananas, ghee, beetle leaf, and areca nut. In the subsequent court of justice the spirit is approached by the villagers for blessings or asked to help resolve conflicts. The judicial program typically starts once the initial rituals are finished. Complaints and judgments are made orally. The Buddha issues the judgment after hearing the sides of the plaintiff as well as the defendant, if both are present. The Buddha's justice must be referable to general principles. He may take a stand, he cannot take sides. While the Buddha may take the opinions of the village headman and other eminent persons into consideration, the ultimate judgment rests with the Buddha. Sometimes judgments are also issued by the tossing of beetle leaves and the counting of flower petals usually areca flower. Particularly difficult cases may also be adjourned to the next year by the Buddha. Some common disputes that come up are related to land issues, family feuds, questions of honor, robbery, debt, mortgage, breach of contract etc. In cases of theft where the offender is unknown, the Buddha may ask for a certain offering before finding the thief. At times the victim offers the entire value of the stolen goods to the Buddha. If the thief is found and penalized, the person is made to pay to the plaintiff a sum that is more than the value of the goods stolen. If the Buddha feels that the thief shows repentance, the gravity of the penalty could be reduced. Possession. The art of being an impersonator is learned. Young boys belonging to the Pambada, Parava, Nalike castes attend rituals where their kin is performing, and they help out with shredding the coconut leaves for the garment of the impersonator, holding the mirror while the impersonator is putting on the makeup etc. 
They learn the art of the performance by observing the performance of their kin and trying to mimic it. Along with being able to mimic the way their kin performed, what is essential to be a successful impersonator is also the aptitude of being possessed by the deity. There are certain rules the impersonator needs to follow to prepare his body for the possession. This may include being a vegetarian and not drinking alcohol. The impersonator feels the sudden spirit possession only for a few seconds but after that he is filled with the deity's energy that lets him behave as the deity for the entire ritual. There are two types of mediators between the spirits and the humans. The first type of mediator is known as the patri. These are members of middle castes such as bunt landowners and bilava toddy tappers, formerly also bow men. The second type of mediator, impersonators typically belongs to scheduled castes such as Pambada, Parava or Nalike. While the Patri has only a sword and a bell as ritual tools, the impersonator uses makeup, ornaments, masks etc. Both mediums are believed to impersonate from an altered state of consciousness. But while the impersonator may speak as the Buddha in the first person and about the Buddha in the third person, i.e. when he recounts his, her padana, the Patri only speaks as the Buddha in the first person. Padana Padanas are major part of Tuluva oral literature. Much of the body of this literature has been built on the legends of the Buddhas and Devas. Padanas have numerous variations for the same narrative. As in other epic traditions, there is no single author. Padanas are orally transmitted and recited. The language of the Padanas is Old Tulu. Some famous examples are the Siri Kumar Padanas and the Koti and Chenaya Padanas. The Padanas sung by women while planting paddy are referred to as field songs. The Padanas recite the origins of the spirits and deities. This is one way for the rituals to reconstruct the past and render a legitimization to it. The singers act as the indigenous narrators of the history of the native land. The Padanas also stand in opposition to the Puranic, male-based principles as they highlight the feminine principles of Mother Earth. The Padanas also reflect multi-socio-cultural background shifts for example, the move from matrilineal system to patrilineal system. The older sense of cosmology is retained through the Padanas. The Padanas also reflect processes of Hinduization and Sanskritization. Gallery. See also Aati Kalanya Yakshagana Nagamandala